Yes, speaking. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is a legendary musician who will, I will introduce by his real name, which is Manfred Lubowitz. But if you don't recognize him by that name, you will definitely recognize him as Manfred Mann. We're very honored to have you join us on the show tonight. Welcome, Manfred. Hi. Hello. Sorry that we woke you up. I guess we got, I don't know, I think it might have been something to do with the time change that we just recently had changed. Uh, definitely, it's, it's at our end. She did say one o'clock your time. Uh -huh. She screwed up. I think she forgot that Swedish time's different to English time. Ah, there but you go. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm awake and it's fine. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Very good. I wanted to ask the, the first question we were talking about. Uh, your real name and your your persona on stage, and you said in an interview one time that uh, you are Manfred uh, Lovowitz, not Manfred Mann. There are two different people. That Manfred Mann is your stage persona, and you're not like your stage persona. How so? Well, first of all, I've, let me let me say this. I've always thought that the people in entertainment generally who are most likely to go mad and be unable to deal with it yeah were people who <laughs> were people who changed their name yeah there you go <laughs> so i always imagined i mean i'm probably wrong about this but i imagine that at school your name is you know fred wimp right and then eventually you know you become a star and you change your name to brent thrust mm -hmm. and then you brand thrust for some years, and then, of course, in any entertainment <laughs> business, eventually, most of the time, you're unsuccessful. Right. Except for very, very few people. Then you forget who you were. You start thinking you're brand thrust. <laughs> um, and I kind of, but actually, I, but I, so I hold on to who I am, and I just think musicians. I don't know what a musician is. It's just a person who can do music. There is a sort of illusion yeah. that musicians are somehow more creative right. generally or more interesting or have some special sensitivities. And this, I've worked with musicians obviously all my life. There's just as many arseholes in musicians as there are in the band. <laughs> yes, them, you know. yes. Well, it can get confusing. It's like that whole thing, Alice Cooper is not necessarily the man because he's Vincent Furnier, you know, it's Alice Cooper refers to a band, so. Yeah, but this, but I'm different because I never had a profile as a person, yeah. but somehow, I, I it's hard to explain, I never think of myself as man for band. Everything I do is the moment I'm away um, from business in well, music, I cease to be Manfred Man. Well, you it know, definitely... Every single, it, Every single thing I do accounts, business, you know, anything, mm -hmm. it's Lubowitz. In fact, somebody generally in life refers, to, if anyone close to me refers to me as Manfred Mann, I actually don't like it and I don't regard them as, as a friend. There you go. My friends wouldn't introduce me like that. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, hard to ex it's hard to explain. But no, um, I get it. Absolutely get it. Well, you know, I don't know how, how well your, your real name would have looked on an album cover, but Manfred Mann is a, a damn cool name. I guess the story behind how your group got named Manfred Mann. Well, no, I was in. I grew up in South Africa, and just I was going to be a jazz piano player, and I just sort of one day I just thought, oh, Manfred Lubowitz doesn't sound good, you know, yeah. didn't, you know, yeah. um, so, so snobby. I don't know, stupid. Actually, there's nothing wrong with it, but. Um, and I just one day it occurred to me in the middle of the afternoon, Manfred Mann. Well, Strange. There you go. And all the rest is history. And and really, if you want to talk about Manfred Mann or whatever, I mean, there's been many names. I never realized until I got into the research. I was always a fan, but I didn't really get as heavy into it as I did when I started studying for the show here. There's several incarnations of your music career. Manfred Mann is only one, and of course, Manfred Mann's Earth Band. But there was other incarnations as well. Well, sorry, what's your name? I didn't get it at the beginning. My name is Terry. Terry, the truth is I'm a bit of a phony. <laughs> and, 
And the reason for that is, is that, and I mean that seriously, I'm not a proper artist. Proper artists write songs about their early life and maybe they express their feelings about the world. I'm an arranger. Mm -hmm. I'm a musical arranger. And in the early 1960s, um, everyone was covering other records, mainly records by black artists mm -hmm. a lot of the time. And we were doing the same thing. And then when Do What Diddy was a hit, after that, the record we, we did was a big failure. And I just realized we were not going to succeed because we were right. No, sorry. We did a record called 54321. That's right. right. And, and that was successful in the UK. Not a great record, but it was successful. And then we wrote another song and it was a big failure. And I listened to the Beatles and I thought, we can't compete on this level as songwriters. So very, very early on, I decided the only way I can compete on this level is at least to work with the best material I could find. So I'm not Frank Sinatra. I'm the guy who did the arrangements. And I had other, you know, so in that sense, I'm a phony. I don't mean that I'm going around every day thinking I'm a phony and in therapy. Mm. But I'm not an artist in that sense that I'm trying to say a specific thing. I like to make records that feel right to me and, you know, Sometimes people leave the band. You have to get other people so it sounds different. So that, uh, that's what I mean. I'm a, I'm a piano player doing arrangements. Oh, there you go. I was, we, go I, I was actually trying to make a reference on the show earlier uh, because a lot of people get confused with, with situations like yourself, like with Bo Donaldson and the Haywoods, because Bo Donaldson wasn't the singer, and, and you're not the singer uh, here. Paul Jones is the singer. But uh, I pretty much reference you to like an Eddie Van Halen. I mean, you know, the backbone of the group, but, you know, the person that did the arrangements and, and played the music and stuff. Is that a fair comparison? Yeah, I think so. Um, but I, I just never had an individual profile. I never particularly wanted to um, in the sense that people know everything you think if people misunderstand everything you say yeah. there's nothing you say that there isn't some arsehole somewhere who gets it completely wrong and repeats it right which is you know and um i never put you know in the beginning i used to say things a bit generally about the world and then you know, i kind of stopped in the end there were people just misunderstanding everything yeah. no but i mean you know i'm i'm incredibly lucky i've had a when i was in school i never thought when i left south africa to go to england I never thought for a minute I'd earn a living as a musician. I just knew one thing. You can only screw up when you're young and you don't have responsibilities. So I gave it a go. I think it's a miracle I had any success at all. <laughs> well, in knowing that you've had such great success with pop songs, I think one of the reasons why is because you are so you know, in depth with all the other genres. I mean, a lot of people don't even realize when they hear some of your pop hits that, that you're not just pop. I mean, you're talking about blues and jazz and everything else. You've got a great music yeah. foundation. Well, that's right. I mean, I, well, I started as a jazz musician. And by the end of the 1960s, I really was a pop fan. Yeah. And to be honest, I, I kind of, when I listen to modern music, I find... I think a lot of the time I actually really like the pop music. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of the of the best songs of Taylor Swift, for example. Um, just you know, beautifully done, beautifully done, tremendous, you know, great atmosphere, and and particularly I'm a huge pro-American because I just think you do make. I mean, apart from a brief period in Britain, I mean, my insult is I call Europe a groove-free zone for example. And I just think that there's a kind of groove in the best US music. It's a groove that's, I don't know, it's almost in your genes, although it can't be. I don't mean to talk eugenics. Yeah. But records have a, a, a much better groove than records made. I mean, I have a granddaughter who was into rap at some point. She may still be, I don't know. But And she was, she was playing me what she, and I could tell with 90%, well, no, hang on, let me not exaggerate, about 85% accuracy, within 15 seconds, I told her whether it was American or English. <laughs> there you go. 
You know, I was wondering yeah. because growing up in South Africa, I know in in Britain certainly they were in tune with the music scene. But I was wondering what the music scene was like uh, in South Africa. But uh, you know, the, the point is, is that you actually came out with what they called the first rock and roll band in South Africa called the Vikings. Is that right? No, that's actually that's absolutely wrong. By the way, oh, okay, um, it's it's in Wikipedia and it's yeah. repeated endlessly. It's completely wrong. I never had a pop group in South Africa at all. Um, I left as a jazz musician who used to who played in coffee bars. Mm. Glad you cleared so that up because that's definitely all over the well, internet. Well, it won't clear it up unless you can control the whole world of communication. <laughs> it, will rem- it, it, it will remain on Wikipedia forever, but it's simply not. It's simply not true. Well, knowing how South Africa was and there was apartheid and everything was going on with the government, what was the music scene like in South Africa? Was it fairly free? Well. well I mean, it was certainly a segregated music scene. Yeah. If you're talking, if you're t- talking on politics and racism, I mean, so I, I would have played a little bit with some black musicians, but not, but not generally, not very much. Um, it was extremely segregated country music scene. I don't really know. I just followed a few black jazz musicians, really. Mm-hmm. Hugh Masekela, a guy called Kippy yeah. McKetsy, Jonas Guangwa. There's just a few people. Um, there was no music scene at all, as far as I could see, yeah. at that time. Well, I do know for a fact, and I read this in the notes, hopefully this is right, although it's very unfortunate. That, speaking of apartheid and that, uh, it was brought to a lot of people's attention with people like Paul Simon and his Graceland album. But I guess you had a situation with it yourself to where they wouldn't let you back into your own country. Is that right? Because you spoke against No, that's, that's also wrong. Mm. Um, I, I thought it was possible they wouldn't. I made an album called Somewhere in Africa in 1986, I think it was, and it was it was slightly political. Well, half of it was a kind of anti-apartheid album. And um, I thought, I was worried that I wouldn't be allowed back in. Mm. In fact, had it been more successful, I probably wouldn't have been allowed back in, but yeah. nobody really noticed it too much. So. It was the advantage of not having a very successful album. <laughs> oh, there you it. go. <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind of a crazy reason that, that you were allowed back in, but then, you know, it's a good thing. I mean, that, that's probably yeah, very well, true. Yeah, well, I wanted yeah. to see my family. I never felt that if I didn't see my family, racism in South Africa would end a, a minute earlier, you know. Yeah. So I, I, I tried not to raise my head too far because I, I think more important to see my grandmother, frankly. For sure, right. for sure. Well, you know, out of all the instruments you play, and I know you play a piano and you play a uh, guitar and this and that, my favorite instrument in the entire world is the mini Moog. How'd you get into playing yeah. that? I love it. Um, I, just, I have to keep correcting your research. I don't play guitar, but um, I'm a keyboard player. But I know Wikipedia says guitar player, yeah. but, but no problem. And I, no, I, I regard myself now just as a synth player, actually. Um, I think it's the only instrument. I mean, if you know what I've done, in that, yeah. you, you, may, you would. I just feel I, the moment I play, I sound different to the other guys. I don't, you know, there's some fantastic players, but I do sound like me. No, in, in 1973, um, there, ha- there were people who had the very, very big moves, you know, the, the things with 100 plugs in, and yeah. it just looked too complicated. And at some point, somebody said, well, there's this place near our studio they've got one you know they they're the importers and i went and looked at it and i i mean i just couldn't believe what are these knobs why is there a thing called cutout another called free frequency (laughs) you know it just it looked so complicated yeah and indeed it is in a way so i anyway i bought it and gradually i found that it had a great sound but it had one all synthesizers in the beginning had one crushing failure and it was there was no touch response so on a piano you hit it harder the note sounds not just louder but brighter right and a lot of the expression on a piano obviously is the way the hammer strikes a string although it's rather odd if you ever look at a piano a hammer strike a string it strikes the string and goes straight back so Lord knows, whenever you see people sort of stroking the key, it really doesn't make any difference because it's already stopped touching. I don't know why the piano should be such a great instrument, but it doesn't just... But anyway, you could get no touch response out of a mood. So every single note sounded the same. And 
you know, although the sound was great, I didn't really like that. It was very alien to me. So I moved the cutoff on the filter, which basically, I don't want to sound technical here, but basically there's only one thing a synthesizer does, and that it sounds like a pussycat. Yeah. In other words, it goes meow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's altering that filter. Every second record is, you know, it's meow, meow. It's like a pussycat. You can make the sound with your mouth. So I changed the filter after a while to create accents as wow, wow, like that, like a mm -hmm. wah-wah pedal. And that's how I developed playing to some extent the way I do now. Um, so I found the Mini Mooga had a great sound, but no touch response. Now synthesizers are more natural, including, including the new Moogs, by the way. Mm -hmm. They are more natural because they have touch response now. So your finger can control it. Your finger now on a modern synthesizer can press down and create a different sound when you hold it and press it. So it's a very, very expressive instrument now. It's still complicated and hard to get a good sound, but the sound on the original Mini Mooc are really good. There's, there's no doubt about that. Well, knowing there's some different things about it that's is definitely complicated, <laughs> would you say anybody that plays a keyboard could play a Moog, or is it that much different? Well, the thing is, playing a keyboard is a thing where you use your musicality and your fingers. To play a synthesizer, to some extent, unfortunately, you've got to use your brain because you're trying to avoid your brain a lot of the time. You want to just play instinctively in the end. So, yeah, anybody can learn to play the damn thing. you just got to learn to turn a knob. That's yeah. why there's so many people who play them badly. <laughs> <laughs> because they're sitting at home. Anyone can make a great sound now. Anyone. I mean, music technology enables anyone to do things that were impossible to were incredibly difficult to do to get a band five guys to play together in extremely good time so you're all together on the beat as close as possible that's when you get a great groove yeah when you just press that on a computer everything's dead in time right. well i know it definitely and, blew my mind i, I used to listen to like tommy james and the shondells one of the first people to use it and, and got on, you know, into the monkeys and that, and Mickey Dolans was big on a synthesizer. It's just a great thing. <clears throat> it's a great thing because it makes, yeah, no, it is a great thing, and I find it very expressive, and that's why I play it most of, you know, a, a lot of the time. I don't yeah. think it's complicated. It's complicated technically, but it's quite difficult sometimes. A piano, a strange thing, I find a piano is quite a forgiving instrument. Yeah. And synthesizer, you've really got to be accurate. You've really got it. If you're not accurate, it really sounds bad. Right. Now, you were talking about uh, kind of in the beginning, you know, if you guys could live up to or, or compete with somebody who was at the status of the Beatles. But I understand that you actually ended up having uh, some interaction with them. I, there was a story I read on your website. Which we know has got to be correct because it's your website, which, not Wikipedia. <laughs> which maybe, maybe you can share. You tried to sell your harmonium to Paul McCartney? Well... Uh, John Mayo, who I think lives in LA now, doesn't he? He's for many years a blues player. He mm -hmm. lived down the road from me. I'm going to walk around the room to heat up my coffee. Okay. Sure. So if this goes wrong, tell me. Now, John Mayo phoned me up one day and said, um, no, this story is absolutely accurate, and said, Matt, you've got a harmonium, haven't you? He said, yes, yeah, I believe it's for sale. I said, sure. He said, well, Paul McCartney's here. Do you want to, can, you know, he, he might be interested in buying it pouring my coffee there. Uh -huh. um, so I said, well, sure. Moving over to the microwave now. We can still hear you. <laughs> okay. And so I thought, my God, Paul McCartney's coming to my house. Because, I mean, I'm also impressed. I'm not kind of a big, cool guy. I was enormously impressed. You know. And, um, but... Myself, I always thought I didn't like people to see me, you know, because people would look at you. You go to a restaurant. This is when I was very recognizable and extremely successful. And, you know, you were never quite as tall. You know, you'd hear someone say, oh, he's not as tall as I thought he was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, he, he doesn't look quite as good as, like, you know, is that really him? Um, but I had a beard and glasses that people knew it was me. Anyway, so I'm really impressed. 20 minutes later, John Mayles at the door, Paul McCartney's with him. Wow. Of course, not quite, and, and I have to tell you, not quite as tall as he looked on television. <laughs> and, and so, 
you know, we, he went to have a look at it. And I'm telling it from my perspective. And I know the money sounds ridiculous now because it was so low, but I was thinking of selling it for eight pounds. First of all, what is a harmonium? I can't oh, pronounce it's, it. it's a home organ. Okay, there you go. You sort of pedal with your feet, you right. know, and it's got a lovely sound, but, you know, I, you know, how can you play while you're basically pedaling? You can't yeah. pedal, you know, you can't tap your foot in time <laughs> with your music, and that means you've got to stop pedaling. You yeah. can't pedal with one foot. Anyway, I just, but it looked nice. Yeah. And I, I was selling it for eight pounds, and I thought, oh, he's got a lot of money. I said twelve pounds. So, in other words, I raised it fifty percent. This is a story much to my discredit, by the way. <laughs> oh, he's a beetle. He could afford it. <laughs> That's not the point. The oh. point is, I, yeah, no, exactly. I try to take advantage of that fact. <laughs> and when people in my life have tried to take advantage of me, I always remember I did that. Oh, he can afford it, which is, of course, totally the wrong thing. If I wanted eight pounds, uh -huh. I was trying to profit from the fact that. He had extra money, and there's no reason. I thought it was him. Eventually, it took me a long time to realize that I was the one who was at fault. Yeah, and he didn't buy it. Now maybe he didn't like it, or maybe he knew I put the price. He knew the value of the thing, and if he knew the value of the thing and didn't buy it, he's quite right. And I was trying to take advantage of him. So I, <laughs> I don't like saying it on the radio, but the story is enormously to my discredit. I hated <laughs> it when people did that with me. Oh, we can afford it. So right. I did the wrong thing. That's the story. But you're not supposed to ask me on radio. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let me let me ask you though. I mean, in knowing that you know you you kind of started out as a jazz musician, and you've even said yourself that that you consider yourself more of a, an arranger. How did you feel about and handle? the the stardom that that you and everybody in the band were thrust into in the 1960s i mean those those hits were huge and all of a sudden you're a pop star yeah the worst thing of being a celebrity is getting recognized when you're not wanting to be recognized and so forth well that's exactly correct the thing is i the, the, if i look to the music business generally over the years the people who've had success that is of the kind of success you really want is Pink Floyd. Yeah. They're not so recognizable that people are screaming at them, shouting. I mean, even when they were younger. Right. You know, they weren't obviously recognizable at the time of Dark Side of the Moon. I reckon some of the guys get away with just shopping in the mall. Um, and I think that's a way better way than, but I had a beard and glasses. I was recognizable across the road. I absolutely <laughs> loathed it. Yeah. I have no, um, I went and we did. We were, we didn't get a lot of money out of all those big hits, by the way. Really, we didn't get. Yeah, well, the deals were so bad. Everyone was honest. They were just paying us a shit on a straight. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, and so I was living in a normal street, and so I was, you know, it, so it was just, you know, there were people constantly. I mean, if you went to the door. And somebody knocked on the door and asked for an autograph. You gave it to them. Then more people came. So eventually, you say no, or you don't answer the door, and then people think you're big time and you're too important. Yeah. To that. I mean, I remember playing a game of tennis in the late '60s with Michael Darbo, and somebody in the middle of the game asked us for a autograph, and I said, "Do you mind until we just finish this game?" And people started shouting, "We put you where you are. Who do you think you are?" Wow. Yeah. I was woken up in the, in a hotel by a chambermaid in the hotel for an autograph at five in the morning, you know. Wow. And so, I mean, those are just. I mean, it gets worse than that. Especially if uh, that. you're standing at a urinal, you know. Yeah. And, and <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let me tell you. Let me tell you a true story, and it's absolutely true. We had a we had an accident in the 1960s, and the car crossed a major kind of motor. It wasn't a motorway then. The guy lost control in some mud on the side of the road. It crossed a major highway, didn't hit another car, and and this is pre seatbelt time. Actually, think of it. Didn't hit another car. Went across an empty car park where there was a, a hut where a lorry drivers were having tea in the middle of the night, and smashed into a car just in front of that hut. Ooh. So we could have flattened that hut and killed those guys. Okay, 
And I kind of woke up and I couldn't breathe. I had to banging my chest. It had knocked the breath out of me. I had bruised ribs, which actually um, are, are not serious, but very painful. Yeah. Paul Jones, I think, had a broken collarbone. It could have, we could have been dead in that car. The people in the hut could have been alive. So bang, they all come out. And as I wake up, I hear them say, bloody hell, it's Manfred Mann. Can I have an autograph? Oh my, oh my gosh. I'm not kidding. And you know, I was once, I walked, I mean, there, there are two instances. I suppose I'm important here. I can tell these stories, okay? <laughs> so I, I was walking, I mean, this is absolutely true as well. Like when I tell the story, this seems impossible. I walked down the road one sunny afternoon near where I lived and a car pulled up about 20, 30 feet in front of me, 20 feet maybe, and one of the doors half opened and the car just stayed there, no one got out. And I thought to myself, I should cross the road. That's, and then I thought, oh, don't be silly. No, that's ridiculous. I got there and two guys jumped out the car. One grabbed me from behind mm. and tried to bundle me in the car. Oh. Oh. And I kicked the car door shut with my leg and then the driver got out. There was one or two, whatever. I, there were certainly two or three, I can't remember. I think three. The driver got out and said, oh, don't kick my car. So I said, well, if you, you know, if, if you don't try and bundle me in the car, I won't kick the car. Yeah. So then a guy got behind me somehow. And try and imagine this physically. He got behind me, pinning my arms to my side so I couldn't move my arms, picked me off the ground, and the other guy held the car open. Oh my God! Wow! Right, so there's n there's nothing you can do. Bang with your head, you can't do anything. He didn't quite pick me off the ground. Sorry, that's the point. He had me held like right, that. Yeah. Now I'm not a big guy. I'm not a tough guy. And about when I was about 15, I read a book on self-defense. And there was only one or two things in that book that I ever remembered. I never went to judo classes. I never went to self-defense. I mean, you know, I never had this. But I remembered what to do in this situation, which just sounds, when I tell it, like even myself, I can't imagine. It's like in survival moment. Right. My brain filtered out. But what you do when someone's holding you like that, if you lift your feet off the ground, he suddenly has to support your whole weight. Exactly. And then you put your, you, you hook your ankles behind his leg and pull back. So he's now got this weight. So he went down, fell on the ground, I fell on top of it. I got up, somebody knocked me, and then a few cars stopped. I'm not sure nowadays they'd stop, but a few cars stopped because they could see what was happening. And these guys got a bit freaked and got back in the car. Okay, and it's, it's a bit more complicated than that, but for the story, imagine they, they drove off. Mm -hmm. About a 10 or 12 year old girl was sitting on, the, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a wood, on a brick wall nearby. Mm -hmm. And when this was over, came up and asked me for an autograph. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you hear stories like that, and of course, the, the, the most tragic story is about what happened to John Lennon from somebody oh, who's supposed to be a fan. I mean, wow. It, I don't know. It's just it's crazy. They forget you're human, for one thing. They forget you're a real person because they see you on TV, they hear you on their stereo speakers. And some of the things well, that. Absolutely correct. And particularly then you know, um, your world was a rarefied world. Now there's so many people on TV, you know, yeah. if you want to see your neighbor, you don't know where they are, you can switch on some channel, they're probably doing an interview. Um, no, it was it was very different then, it's, it's true. But anyway, I didn't like that. And th those are two stories, I mean, I'm not saying they happened every day of the week, I remember them because they weren't common, of course. Right. I wouldn't like all that so much, but I wouldn't mind the adulation from all the girls, you know, that, that has to be a fun part of it. Well, if you want to, if you want to know a big truth about girls, and you know, I'm, I know I'm not on the radio and this is confidential. <laughs> I found in practice that the more successful you were, the more difficult it was to um, to hook up with a girl if you're on tour. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is you were protected by security, everybody's eyes were on you. The very best thing was to be playing a little club in Wisconsin somewhere <laughs> where, where you might mix and meet with people at the bar and you weren't so important. 
so oddly enough, being very successful. You don't need that level of success. It works better if you're a bit less successful. <laughs> I never thought about that. I guess that would be true. Well, nowadays it's, it's dangerous to be a celebrity and try to uh, date a fan or anything because, you know, all they got to do is say somebody touched them, and all of a sudden, you know, they're trying to get a bunch of money out of them. So it would be even worse now, that's for sure. I want um, to go ahead. Get, carry, like, sorry, go on. I was just going to say that I wanted to find out. You was talking about back in the day not making a lot of money, and unfortunately that's a story with a lot of groups and, and single artists themselves. Uh, but one thing about you, I would assume you somewhat had control, or a little bit more so than most people, because you got to do some things that some of the artists don't really get to do, and the fact you got to do different genres of music and even uh, did instrumentals, which I love your instrumentals. I mean, mm -hmm. that was kind of rare for somebody like you. Did you really kind of have control over what you were doing, or did they try to pigeonhole you into doing all pop songs and so forth? No, I never had a real problem with... Um anyone controlling i mean we wanted we understood very well that if you don't do pop songs you won't earn a living in the yeah. 60s and even to this day if you if you look at what i've done if i was a keyboard player did all those instrumentals and played as well or as badly on whatever level that i did all the time i would not really have been as successful as if i had uh as having done Blinded by the Light. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so actually nobody had to tell me that. Uh, you know, I, I knew that. Nobody was making me do things I didn't want. I mean, occasionally that happened, but it wasn't a major feature of my career at all. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting because in the people that I've talked to, and I guess it maybe depends on the generation fr that they're from, but people will usually either reference Manfred Mann's Earth Band and Blinded by the Light and things like that and not have any clue about your 60s stuff or they'll know the 60s stuff and not know the, the more recent stuff or the Earth Band. Um, have you found, what have you found as far as the, the generations or the demographic of, of people that are your fan base now? Because I know just up until COVID, you guys were still touring. Yeah, that's right. With, I mean, the first thing to say is that one of the ways I look at a record sale is is this is somebody gets up in the morning let's let's go to the land of cds we're not in streaming now right gets up in the morning and they could spend some money on a, a nice shirt put it towards a shirt that they could buy and they think oh, no, i'm not going to buy that shirt I, I, you know i won't buy the shirt. i've got something else in mind they go out they could have three or four coffees or a meal no i won't do that i'm a bit hungry i'll go walk past the video shop in the days when there were video shop and I'll go to the music shop. The first thing is, it's a miracle that the person's even got to the music shop. Yeah. Okay, then they go to the music shop, Bruce Springsteen's Greatest Hits, no, nah, not interested. The Beach Boys, not interested. Rihanna, Taylor Swift, not interested. If you can get one person on the planet to walk past everything else and buy Manfred Mann's Earth Band to sell one record, it's a bloody miracle. Right. You know, if you, if you put it that way, and music is very interesting. I think people don't understand. Music is absolutely unique in a, in, a, in a way. And I'm talking business and commerciality. If you want to buy the best painting in the world, you need half a, half a billion dollars or something, you know, or you want to buy a Rembrandt, you know. And if you want to buy the crap painting from your neighbor, it costs almost nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you want to buy the best record in the world, it costs you the same as the worst. Yeah. It's it's a it's an unbelievable thing. There's an incredible innate democracy that a great record costs the same as a really bad record. Right. So you know, so the fact that people can buy your record, you know, you're not putting your record cheaper. Your record's the same price in the sixties. Our record's the same price as the Beatles' record. Exactly. They haven't saved, folks. You know, it's and I don't think people realise that. They're so used to it they can't see it. But it's an amazing thing. It happens in nothing else. There's no other industry or art, and I'm aware that this happens. With mm -hmm. and so the public are quite a good guide if they get a chance to hear music. If sometimes you don't get a chance to hear music, but mm -hmm. if you get a chance. The public are quite a good guide as to what's good. Right. Well, you yeah. know, you had very clever lyrics too. I mean, one one 
lyric that I thought was the most clever thing I ever heard was, My name is Jack and I live in the back. Now, I understand that song was about a drug dealer. Is that right? You know something? The first thing to understand is is that I, I really never see music in terms of what it's trying to say. Yeah. I know I should, and I know journalists love it. Journalists love reviewing songs. Sorry, that's my... Sorry, I'm going to have to do something. This was when I was supposed to, to wake up. That's my alarm. Oh, it's your alarm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I do. I'm going to press this and come back on. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still, still there. there. Yeah. Oh, okay. The alarm. The alarm's gone. I've forgotten. What was I saying? Well, you were you were talking about how you don't see songs based on their lyrics, even though the journalists yeah, always want to ask yeah. about that. Journalists have to write about something, mm -hmm. and the world of journalism is the world of words, and the world of music is really the world of sound. And to me, yeah, just for a moment, I read, they love to write, an artist, and I never understand this, an artist can be subversive, an artist can, can say something about society and the degradation, all the wonderful things of love, I think, but if the drummer plays out of time, it's a bad record, folks. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't just about the lyrics and the meaning. It is actually about the music. So I've forgotten what point well, I'm making. Well, oh, I said lyrics, lyrics. Yes. So as long as lyrics weren't really bad, I just recorded them. I mean, I have no idea what Mighty Quinn's about or <laughs> Blinded by the Light. Well, I'm the faintest idea, and I made the record. Let me ask you then, uh, if, if it, I guess, based off of what you're saying, I guess it wouldn't bother you, but one of the things that people always talk about, and it kind of goes into this whole Mandela effect of how the, you know, the public as a whole remembers things incorrectly, but with Blinded by the Light, a lot of people swear that the word douche is in there when really it's revved up like a deuce. Did that kind of misinterpretation ever bother you of your lyrics? I always thought you were talking in the record about douche like he's a douchebag. And it was Hang on, this is, this is a great... So I'm going to tell you the true story of that. Okay, okay. great. We, we recorded it as, as douche. We did say wrap up wrapped up it's because I don't listen to the original after I've heard the Springsteen record I didn't go listening and checking it the only way to get your own version is to ignore the original so I got the words wrong yeah so we ended up with wrapped up like a deuce yeah. d-e-u-c-e -E. but in the days of tape machines the tape head was at a slight angle and when it was then played again it's hard to explain as a myth of a tape head technical stuff it came out like douche instead of do. So it's a technical error. Mm -hmm. But it becomes more interesting. Warner Brothers, at some point, trying to get the record played in the US, says we can't get it played in the Southern Bible Belt stations because they think it's douche. And, <laughs> and, and the big crime, of course, the big crime is, I never understand this about religion, is that they're so so bothered about the human body surely it's made in the uh, image of god you know but uh -huh. anyway whatever so got anything to do with vaginas and douche you can't play this on the radio <laughs> for you <laughs> so i'm then told they won't play it on the southern bible belt station right can you change it well we, it's very very difficult and extremely difficult we could never remake the record i can't explain why cross fading and it was it was ridiculously difficult. Simp it was, wasn't a complex record. But, uh, we'd made a complex record and had to simplify it. What you hear is a simplified. Anyway, we couldn't do it. But we put it back on a tape head, and we could actually get it to be deuce. But the rest of the record, all the S's, all the high frequencies went wrong. Uh -huh. So all the high hats sounded wrong. Everything sounded terrible. The only thing that we corrected was deuce. So I said to Warner Brothers, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't release a bad record. And if the record fails, the record fails. Nothing I can do about it. But eventually the record goes to number one and everyone starts asking questions like you. Is it douche or douche? <laughs> and, so, and indeed, a lot of people in the U.S. say, that's why it got all the way to number one, because everyone was talking about whether it's douche or douche. <laughs> it's amazing how people misinterpret things. I was interviewing Melanie and I told her I thought Brand New Key was about having sex. She's like, are you crazy? <laughs> 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 but, 
Well, the thing is, she wrote those, and she knows. I actually don't know what songs mean. So, I, all I know is, my name is Jack, and I sing in the back of the Greta. It's just a beautiful set of words. It is. It and is. the public very often. I mean, the public very often don't care either. For all the talk, I'll give you an example. I, um, Bruce Springsteen, born in the USA, is a kind of left-wing song about about American workers. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan used it as a as a campaign song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, then on the other hand, you know, you talk about the the lyrics didn't ring didn't ring a bell or mean that much to you, whatever. Uh, you said that you like sounds in this and that. Right in the middle of uh, "Blinded by the Light," you play chopsticks. I love that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why, but um, <laughs> it sounded good. It was. You know, no, absolutely. I wouldn't do it. It didn't sound good, but of course, that's not lyrics. We weren't saying the word chopsticks. No, <laughs> I thought it was great because here you are, you know, as good as you are on the synthesizer and the keyboards and everything, and you just go back to like first grade and play chopsticks. I just thought it was <laughs> it was clever as hell. I really did. Yeah, well, on stage, well, yes, it had that kind of thing about it, but on stage, we play it, and I play chopsticks, and then. Um, in fact, since it's radio, I'll go over to the keyboard and play it okay, for you. Okay, great. Um, and um, it takes a minute to switch on. Sure. But, um, so, as part of the gig now, we're going... Can you hear that? Yeah, yes. we can hear it, sure. So then play it a bit faster and stuff. It's not that difficult to do, actually. Yeah. But um, there we go. Well, that, that's fantastic. We, you know, we heard the story about how uh, your record label started calling you Manfred Mann. But as far as when you went into Manfred Mann's Earth Band, was that something to do with the, the era of the time of maybe a nod towards ecology? Or how did that come about with the Earth being added? Well, I, was, I saw an interview the other day that I'd done a sort of some years ago which said it needed band to rhyme with man so it needed the word band on the end mm -hmm. and then at one time I thought how about an arm band man for man's arm band I mean let's be silly I like the idea of things being fun yes right. absolutely how about man, for man, man for man's arm band I kind of had a slight Nazi feeling you know just just uh, <laughs> maybe, you know maybe not and then I thought how about Manfred man's headband but then I thought, right, it's sort of a bit hippie-ish, you know, and I wasn't really a hippie at all. And so, in the end, headband, armband, elastic band, yeah, a bit too flippant <laughs> in the end. And in the end, we got all serious and called it Earthband. Yeah. But it was, it was an ecology reference. Yeah, the there you go. Yeah. I thought it might have something to do with it. You know, we talk about lyrics and being clever or not. And people getting mixed up with the word douche and all that. Uh, I, I love simple lyrics back in the fifties to where you know some of the noises and nonsensical things they said. There was no other lyric in the world that was more like that. It kind of brought me back to the day when a lyric would come out and say "do wa jitty jitty." Now, how does yeah. that come about? And and has anybody misinterpreted that? Does anybody wonder what that's about? Well, remember, I didn't. It was a girl walking down there. She was walking down the street. But I remember, I didn't write these lyrics. Yeah. So I, I'm right. just picking up on them. Um, I mean, one of you know, the other day I was asked, but people would always misunderstand somehow. What's my um, favorite record of all time? Right. And you know, and the most meaningful record, it's "Do the Locomotion" by Little Eva. Really. And I just love. It's about doing a dance and having a good time. And, you know, I may be all Mr. Serious as a musician, <laughs> but I have a huge respect for simple pop music. And I think it's an enormously difficult thing. I find it the easiest thing in the world to write weird music and be strange. It's just so easy. Oh, bloody hell, that's my thing again. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, it's evil, but it's also good. No, it's actually very good. Look, we're talking here at no cost. It's, it's ridiculous. True. Yeah, over a computer. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, no, it is It is crazy. Um, no, so 
I think simple pop music is really hard to do. And that is, in some ways, why I like Taylor Swift. You know, some of it is just girly, good time music. I'm not saying all of it is, but there's just some things, and it's just, it's such a difficult thing to do. Yeah, and it's fine. It doesn't have to be Beethoven. I mean, what's wrong with just simple, silly songs or something as simple? Yeah, but they're hard to write. They're actually really difficult to do. I mean, the thing is, you think, it isn't that it's easy. It's actually to write quality, happy songs. Quality. I'm not just talking about we're all having a good time dancing from the, you know, you know, running through the forest all smiling and laughing. If you to write a great song, and it's simple, and that is a real art. It's not a question of just good time or serious. It's just, it's just very difficult. And do the locomotion is kind of quite complex. Mm -hmm. But it sounds so simple. And it's not even a question of complexity. I mean, I love Taylor Swift's yeah. Me. I think it's just like, and it is a really, you know, it's quite complicated. And it's difficult to do that stuff. It's not easy. It's easy to write Three Blind Mice, but it ain't easy to write stuff like that and to do it well. And, and songs are so different, too, when the same song is done by different artists. For instance, how do you think uh, your ha-ha, said the clown, differs to when the Yardbirds did it? I didn't even know they had done it, had they? Yeah, they yeah. did. Yeah. Oh, well, I can't answer it because I never heard it. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I know I found out in my notes you did an, instrum an instrumental version of a Sweet Pea, excuse me, Sweet Pea by Tommy Rowe. i got to hear that because that's a good song. Yeah, I can't remember. Um I, 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 you know, the truth is, I don't really listen much to what I did no. in the past. I'm very, very caught up in what I do every day, and I find music very difficult. And it's, and so this pandemic year has been really good for me. I'm sitting at home. I'm working with a guy online, and you know, we're struggling and doing this, and then we change our minds, and it's all. That I've really enjoyed it, and I'm continue to do so. You know. Well, I don't well, know. That's a perfect opportunity to ask you uh, if there's a, a new album coming, because I know I believe the last thing that you guys released was in May of 2019, but that was Radio Days Volume Four, which was primarily old BBC radio recordings. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, is um, there new yes. new stuff coming out? Yeah, but it'll be a cut. That'll probably be a year and a half before it's done. And I really, yeah, I don't like talking about it. Music isn't something you should talk about. Right. Um, at some point, maybe you hear it. But right. I take it as new stuff, or is it like uh, reading? Oh, it no, it's never new stuff. Well, some of it's new stuff, yeah. Some, we know it's all new. Yeah. Um, but again, I didn't write all of it. Yeah. Um, so, it, it but, um, you know, anyway, that's what I do all day, and then I practice so that as soon as you... As soon as, as soon as I have to heat my coffee up again. Um, well, I, I know back uh, back in the day between bands, you used to do commercial jingles and that. I mean, do you do any of that anymore? I tell you something. Uh, maybe I had too big an ego. I would do a commercial, and we'd sit in the room with the advertising people, and they'd say, gee, Manfred, that's great. And then I'd walk out, and I thought, well, that's just one guy who liked what I did. When it got on the, you know... When it got on it on TV, you know, advertising yogurt or something, yeah. nobody knew it was me. So when we were very unsuccessful in the early '70s, so when I landed up in the early days of Earth Band, and I'd be somewhere up the motorway in England playing to 40 people, I thought, well, that's actually 4,000 percent more, or 400 percent more than when I was doing the advertising. <laughs> um, so, so no, and um, I mean. I remember doing an and we got in the room and it was it was all these um all I who did alien actually was the TV director at the time. Ridley Scott, yeah. Um, and we got in this room and the advert was for first of all everyone was a cliche. All the guys in the the account executives were all wearing suits and ties. Mm -hmm. The art director was wearing a, a big woolly jersey and smoking a pipe. So, you know, it was absolutely like straight out of central casting. <laughs> and even me sitting there in a kind of black roll neck being the sort of pop musician. I mean, it was, we were all cliches. And then the advert was 
a guy walks into a shop and he says to a woman, he says, do you have any girdles? Or she says, yes, what girdle do you want, says the girl to this man. And he says, what girdle do you wear? <laughs> and at which point the piece of music comes in. What does the girl at the girdle counter wear when the girdle girls are busy girdling girls, right? Right. And, and then, uh, that's my brilliant contribution there, not the lyrics, of course. And then, and then she jumps up and they, or they all sing, she wears Gossard answer, Gossard's answer girdles, shape you, young, which is the big thing. <laughs> and I just had enough of this, I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just so ridiculous. So, yeah, and no, I had to stop. It's nobody's fault. And, and I also realized that the advertising industry and that kind of industry was just as um, caught up in who was trendy as the music business. Yeah. It, it, there was no safety in income there. It, if you stopped being successful, you probably wouldn't get adverts anymore. And it was really, it, it was interesting for a while. Well, a lot of people that are into music wind up being in acting, and I, I don't know, maybe it's easier to get an acting role because you are known as a musician, but you actually kind of got to play something in, in a show that kind of went back to your roots, and that's the fact that you actually got to play a jazz musician on the uh, uh, Venus and Furs from 1969. And also, you were on the Red Skelton show. I mean, you were on a lot of different things. Yeah, but you know, if you mention Venus in Furs now, you've just really not made a friend across the Atlantic on Skype. Uh-oh. Why, why, why is that? Well... <laughs> I remember being asked one day, would I fly to Spain to do a, a, to do a scene, as a scene in a kind of sex Roman orgy, and I thought, wow, you know, this <laughs> sounds a bit, I, I remember thinking, this sounds a bit of a good idea, but, yeah. you know, you know, you know, so I went over there, and all it was, was me in a room, and they were going to playing piano, miming piano, and then flying back to London all on my own. I wasn't in this big kind of <laughs> degrading orgy. Oh and, um, and But when the film came out, it looked, they had this kind of thing that only you only had in past days where sex was people eating grapes and laughing with an evil smile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of thing where you right. eat one grape and right. a, girl in a, a girl in a bikini feeds you a grape or something and you laugh and with a moustache or something and, go, <laughs> and everyone does that. Actually, somehow it's on, some, sometimes with all that implication, it's even more seedy, you know that. Right. But anyway, so, and then the film comes out and it looks as if I'm there in the club. It was even worse. You know? Oh, my. Terrible. Awful. I imagine it was much more, uh, I would say, fun, or at least putting you at ease when you can do shows like Tops of the Pops, because then you get to be, you know, you don't have to worry about orgies going on around you, or not. <laughs> no, that's right. Top of the Pops was fine. Although, actually, you know something, one of the very successful British DJs who used to do it a lot, um... I mean, he died, but he was he he was a terrible child abuser. People, mm. well, not child, but certainly women well under the age of thing. And he was on top of the pops a lot. A guy called Jimmy Savile. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Well, Lovely we, enough. Before anyway, we end this here, uh, and you know, we're almost to the end. I got to ask you about the Mighty Queen, because that was such a huge hit. And I love the music video. You know, with all the video on behind you and everything. Uh, is that one of your favorite songs? I know you said it wasn't. You didn't mention it, but I thought maybe it might be. Um, not, no. I think the record, the 60s record, I, when I listen to it, I don't, I like the song a lot. We still yeah. play it live. It's the only one we play from the past. And it is, it's quite interesting how Dylan can make these songs out of just three chords, you know, and, and beauty, yeah, it really is so simple and very clever at, at the same time. So, yes, I do. I like it. But I like the way we do it with Man From Man's Earth Band as a much heavier kind of rock thing rather than the 60s one. Right. Well, I take so, it you're still performing with Paul. I mean, Paul's doing okay? No, I'm not working with Paul at all. I mean, I stopped working. You, do you mean Chris Thompson and your mouth's going funny? Uh, yes, yes. Well, he means Chris Thompson? Yes. No. The answer is no. Chris left the group, you know, and I managed to hold him on for some years to do stuff 
But, you know, in the end, he went his own way, not because there's any bad feeling. He just wanted to do, you know, he was a bit of a writer. And um, I think he, I think. But you guys, when, are, you guys are still with, I mean, Paul Jones is still with you guys, Yeah, that's right? who I was referring to as Paul Jones. No, none of the 60s guys are with me. I mean, Manfred Man's Earth Band, Manfred Man's Earth Band didn't have a single guy from the 1960s. Well, except for you. Well, of course, but I, mean, <laughs> but I mean, I didn't work with, I haven't worked with anybody since 1970 right. from the 1960s at all. No, we, we don't play that music, and um, we're playing music from Man's Man's Earth Band, which isn't the stuff from the 60s, right. and but, never was. So, to, to wrap this up, though, I know everything kind of got put on hold because of, you know, everything that went crazy in the world, but... Uh, are you still keeping in contact with the band? Is there any discussion or plans to start touring? Because I know things are, you know, restrictions are starting to be lifted. So is there any plans to go back out on tour? Well, you know, it, to some extent it's out of my hands because the gigs are cancelled or stopped. Right. So I think at the moment we have a date sheet which starts in October. Um, and because even if I'm vaccinated successfully, um, I don't want to come back and give my wife COVID, so she's no. got to be, she's, and she's lower down the list, she's younger than me, so she's down the list, and we're in Sweden, which is sort of behind, it's, it's moving slower here, so at the moment, we're assuming that by COVID, she, that both of us would have been vaccinated, yeah. so probably there are gigs in it at COVID. but I mean, I am increasingly, I mean, you can hear by talking to me that I'm not ill or slow or in any way i mean i'm 80 years old but i did have a s small stroke about three years ago mm. and sometimes when i get up i feel dizzy and so on and i'm not sure how well i haven't been on the road now for a year i'm not sure how well i would be traveling on my own picking up suitcases standing in queues you know not getting enough sleep i'm not sure how well i'll be able to deal with that right, right. so i don't know whether i will continue doing gigs i like the gigs but i and i like my friends you know the guys i work with we get on very well but i don't really like the traveling and being away from home too much so yeah. i really don't know what's going to happen but at the moment we have gigs in and i, I will do them right, right yeah the road is certainly a hard life and and it, it's incredible that you know at 80 you're still rocking period without even yeah. worrying about doing the road i mean it's incredible and and you definitely are, are, are with it and it's been a great pleasure to talk to you I'm a big fan, and you're you're one of my my favorite legends out there. I mean, you you oh, thank given you. me a lot of entertainment in my life, and and like Good. I said, anybody I'll not I'll not be rocking out at 80 years old. <laughs> you got way more on me. I I find it you know not too easy to get out of bed in the morning, but to hear well, I'll give you I'll tell you two things. One is it's incredibly important to be active. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not referring to going to the gym, and I'm not referring to making massive efforts. I'm just referring to generally active, I think, is important. And the other thing, and I know nobody will do this because there's a very subtle technique, and it's called Alexander Technique. And I'm, I'm not talking about alternative medicine here. I'm not someone who's against the medical profession. But it's a way of holding your body. And if you, all the Alexander teachers live to their late 80s, and a lot of people are bent over and hunched and they try and sit straight and if you try and sit straight you use your big muscles it's really complicated and Alexander technique is a method of doing of undoing the bad habits so it's not a question of, gee I'm really gonna do this and pick up weights and hold my <laughs> muscles in it's a way of releasing it sounds it sounds a bit brown rice and hippie but it ain't right. um, and I'm not like that at all I'm extremely grounded but I do do that and I walk very straight and I wasn't, when I was in my 50s, I wasn't walking like that. It's a very subtle thing, very, very hard to grasp. And it started with, an, I sound like an evangelist, I'm not asking you to join a cult. <laughs> I'll stop there, but look it up. But half the teachers are all a bit weird, and they all talk spiritual. I'm not a spiritual person in that way. Right. It's a very realistic, and I do stand very well. And if you stand well, you feel better right. and if you feel better you'll put oh, I don't know I'm probably also lucky yeah <laughs> it's genes I'm sorry I'm sounding like a born-again Christian <laughs> I if, if you want to sound like an evangelist uh, complain to Wikipedia it's got so much wrong information, information yes. on you yeah. oh absolutely yeah, yeah. Uh, actually you know something most of it's right 
but the early years are wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the South African bit's wrong. I take it as far as your career goes that you much uh, prefer your work with uh, the Earth Band than the uh, early 60s stuff with Man for Man. Well, I don't really know. I don't, I, you know, there's only one record I ever made. I made a record in South Africa in the early 90s called Plains Music with some African guys. It's very, very cool and it's, it's based on North, North American Indian melodies, which I write, I wrote bits of songs around. It's the only album I can ever listen to. Mm. It's a total failure. Plains music. It's about music from the American plains. It's very cool, very relaxed, and it's the only thing I listen to. I can't listen to most of what I've done. I just think, oh my God, I did that badly. That's badly mixed. I just hear what's wrong with everything. Right. Well, you're, it was like you said in an interview one time. You are a musician from head to toe. That's the way you think. That's the way you hear much more of a musician than a pop artist. That's for sure. Well, yeah, but you know, yes, whatever. I, I, whatever. Human being first, I think. There you right, go. Right. There you go. Well, Manfred, yeah. I want to thank you so much for spending so much time with us today, and and I apologize again for waking you up, but we've really enjoyed the uh, the interview and the conversation. It's been our honor to have yeah. you on the show. Yeah. Okay. So it's nice to talk to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Absolutely. Have a, good night. have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you very much. All bye. right. Bye bye. <laughs>